to everybody who's just joining us, my name is Heather Brooks. Eve Hill, myself, and Amy Roberts are um, your Aging in Place Network admins. We are here to empower and educate everybody in the Aging in Place field by bringing in experts from all over the nation to talk about everything just that, aging in place. <laughs> and what happens? I mean, it's a whole process. For, I mean, I was just having that conversation with even Amy before you hopped on. So I am going to let Amy introduce you. But before I do, we are recording this. So if for some reason you drop off of this or you don't, um, you aren't able to watch it, it will be on YouTube channel. Um, we'll have the link posted in the Aging in Place Network. Uh, so welcome. And Amy Roberts, go for <laughs> <Hi>. it. <laughs> and Heather's absolutely right. So whenever we reach out to a connection, no matter what, uh, they can, however the link is, uh, something always comes back. And that's how I came across Esther again. So Esther and I started, she said, kindergarten. I didn't remember kindergarten, but we, I remembered elementary school through mm -hmm. high school. And, um, this one day I was at the Alamo area home care council and I had spoken and then somebody after was somebody that Jose, um, Jose, that's right. Came up and said, you've got to meet Esther. And I'm like, Oh, okay. I've only known one other Esther in my life <laughs> back in high school. And then, um, and then right after that, I was meeting with another mutual friend Lori and she goes, Amy, you've got to meet Esther. And that was just within an hour. And I'm like, okay, Esther, we are destined to get back together again. And so I called her and uh, the rest is history. But um, what I remember about Esther is her leadership. And, um, and then the more I've learned about her life, uh, she's an incredibly strong, strong woman. And her her storms of life and the things that she has come through uh, is going to be your rainbow because she has um, turned things around to help others. And I'm proud to, to know her and bring her with us today. She's an author. She's an educator. She's a mentor, a business owner. She can do it all. <laughs> so everybody, Esther Pippoli. Oh, thank you, Amy. And it's so good to um, be with everybody. And I know I'm glad we're being taped. And if you're on Facebook Live, thanks for joining. I know you have a lot of other things you can be doing, but um, with that, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna talk to y'all a little bit about Lola and tell you about me. Um, and thank you for being here. So don't be scared. I always tell people when you see my screen, don't be scared because it's a lot of stuff going on at the same time. I run from one place to the other. So today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about you don't know what you don't know which is a conversation with Lola. First of all, Lola was my mother. Uh, she was my strong champion. She was a very strong woman and she taught me a lot about how to have a good and solid voice. And for that, I'm very thankful because when it came time to go through my journey in life, which I'll tell you about in a little bit. in the back holding it holding down the family the fort and she was a PhD she was extremely intelligent was a professor at UT Austin and um and it's, it's saying that my internet's unstable so I apologize if we freeze a little but I hope you can still hear me so with that let me get going here okay so in 2014 I this is me I was sitting on the floor actually in a bathroom at my employer's office in December or November of 2014 I had lost my father and my husband 63 days apart. And that was in July to September. As a matter of fact, I'm coming up on the eighth anniversary of him graduating into heaven. And uh, for my dad, it was very, um, it was a long process. He was 81. We'd had all the difficult conversations and we had talked about what was going to happen, you know, the end of life and the transition and what he expected and what he wanted. And first and foremost, my mother had died in 1999. So I was my dad's person. My older brother uh, was uh, had a special needs child. So he really was kind of maxed out on what he could do to help. And my sister lived in Dallas. And so I was in San Antonio and I was it. And my dad was a very active uh, AARP president for the state of Texas, very active economics professor, was always busy, had to be on his calendar. 
And so when he got sick in the last year of his life, I just knew, um, you know, it was going to be a long, hard year. And I was a durable power of attorney. So I was making every decision down to an aspirin. He would not to even take an aspirin without them calling me. And um, I had taken a job. My husband and I at the time had decided our last child had graduated from college. And we decided, where do we want to go? And my husband had a dream. And I said, well, I'd always wanted to work in Denver, Colorado. So I called a recruiter, went to go work in Denver. So I was there from 2013 to 2015. And during this period of time, I was going back and forth. And when my father um, passed away in 2014, I thought, okay, I can pull myself together. I can be a good employee and a good wife again, because um, a lot of attention went towards my father and his care. And the day that we buried my dad, my husband said, I don't feel good. And um, 10 days from the day that my father died, my husband was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And it was a Hail Mary pass. He went to Tijuana. He was um, trying everything to extend his life. But unfortunately, he um, passed away in September of 2014. And I will tell you, I want to take a step back here because what people don't understand is that I was an employee. So I was working this whole time being a caregiver. And then for my dad, and then my husband gets sick. So then I'm a caregiver for my husband. And my employer came to me and said, you know, wow, your PTO, your pay, your paid time off is, is lapsed. You really don't have anything left. Um, is there any way that when your husband goes to Tijuana for cancer emergency, Hail Mary cancer treatment, that anybody else can go with him but you? And in that moment, I was so freaked out about um, keeping my job and taking care of paying bills. And my husband was self-employed as an attorney here in San Antonio that I said, you know what, let me see if I can talk to my daughter. And she was 24 at the time. And she ended up volunteering to um, go with my husband. And so the last two weeks of my husband's life, instead of me being with him and being by his side, my daughter was with him and um, they made it back to Denver, Colorado. We got back to San Antonio, Texas on a friend's plane that came to pick us up in Denver so that we could get back here and he could pass away in Texas. And um, it was just a really, really scary time. So I come to this picture and I tell you all of that, not to make you feel bad, but to understand as an employee, my employer was saying, hey, I need you to kind of think about your job first and going back in time, you cannot get that time back. And I feel really badly that I put my daughter in a position that at 24, she was going with her dad to Tijuana to do cancer treatment. And I was sitting in my cube daydreaming because I couldn't focus on work. So uh, when people are caregiving and their employees, I think that's something that we really need to focus in on because they need so much help. And that's really why Lola started because I needed somebody to guide me. And I really needed in that moment for somebody to tell me, no, 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 no. Your employer saying that they need you. They don't. Your husband in his life is more important than you staying and having to do work. And there was nobody to advocate for me. So in that period of time, I started really early on realizing that there was a missing element in the process between an employee and an employer, um, as well as friends and family. You know, I had friends and family that were willing to help me, but I was really scared to ask for help. So this was me. I ended up um, going, my husband passing away three weeks after he um, died. I went back to work. As a matter of fact, my employer kind of gave me the date to come back to work. I was closing down a law office in San Antonio for my husband. I knew nothing about, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I did not know what to keep, throw away or um, save in, 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 you know, scan. So I was relying on people like March Churchill at the San Antonio Bar Association to tell me what to keep. And I was packing up my husband's life that he had worked so hard for in 26 years. And I say that as as a wife of an employer, self-employed person, because again, in that time frame, being a caregiver, somebody passes away and there are all these things that have to go into effect. And one of the things that I had to do was make a difficult decision on our family home in San Antonio. So we had listed it for sale and I ended up dropping it by $20,000 to get it sold. When I realized where all the bills were and everything that was in chaos, um, I called the real estate agent. And again, this was somebody that was not my person. This was my husband's person that had listed the house. I did just was on a fire sale. And so knowing that that's kind of how I started loss of life advocates. So in 2017, I had, uh, had to file a lawsuit against an insurance policy to get my husband's life insurance. And after we settled, my attorneys took their portion and I took what was left of the proceeds and I self-funded a company named after my mom. And yes, I talk a lot about the elephant because it is the elephant in the room. Nobody wants to talk about a life transition or any of the hard and difficult conversations that go into what if 
and you know it's going to happen. So that with that, I wanted to kind of tell you my story and why I'm here and what I do. And so I'm going to share a little bit with you um, what I think is important. It might pertain to what you do. You might know somebody that needs this. And by all means, if anybody needs help, please ask them to give us a holler, look us up. Um, we are available. And Lola is um, throughout the state of Texas. We have advocates that work Lola. And so um, we're here to help. And I'll tell you more about our trusted partners towards the end of our presentation. So today's question for everybody is, if you're faced with a family who is not planned for an end of life transition, who do you turn to? Do you have a plan in place? Do you feel your current education provides you, you with the knowledge to guide a family through a difficult conversation? Well, this is actually a picture of a friend of mine who is a nurse at the UT Health Science Center. Her name is Debbie James. She is emphatic about educating around loss and life and the life transition. And she, her and I worked on a board together, the Hospice Palliative Nurses Association. And so she teaches nurses and doctors about the end of life. She teaches them about hospice and palliative care and life transition. And so when her father took a fall after leaving church one day, he fell. And um, from there, his life declined rapidly. And um, she was calling me from the hospital and saying, look, my dad just finally said to me, you know, I'm going to die. What do I need to know? I don't know what I don't know. So educate me. So this is Debbie's dad before he fell and her mom, Dottie, and her daughter, and that is them before. So the reality is what you probably think is that your wife or partner will know what to do. Your family will know who to call. Your CPA lawyer or financial advisor will protect the family. And the social worker, or chaplain, or case manager does this for a family if they're in hospice. The truth is the family affairs are probably in multiple places. The family becomes vulnerable. Friends and family will go into self-preservation mode and theft happens. And I tell you theft happens and I, I underline that because when my husband passed away, we had more than one or two or three or five people that were stealing from him, charging on his credit cards, taking things out of his office, taking clients away from him. There was a really, I had a really hard time finding anybody that would be honest with me because I did not know anything about a law office. And I was married to my husband for 26 years. So it wasn't like we didn't know and we didn't talk about things. I just didn't run his office. And so the people that he did business with were um, taking advantage of him during the time period that he was dying and right after he died. And it was really hard for me to watch my husband calling people before he died and they weren't calling him back. And so I will tell you that the number one thing theft happens. And if people don't, if you don't protect it, you don't have the right people in your corner, this can be a very, very scary thing for anybody. So let's review a scenario. A husband is in the hospital. He has been the bill payer and holder of all financial information. His family and spouse go into a spin. Where is everything? Our final documents and affairs in order in place. Do we know his final wishes? So this is Debbie's personal story. And again, we usually present this together and I love her story because here's a nurse that calls me and says, Esther, I don't know what I don't know. So we immediately go into, okay, does he have his legal documents? Does he have this in place? Does he have that? Well, he did not have his legal documents in place. He was a veteran. And so we knew that through the veteran side of things that we'd be able to find, um, get him benefits and stuff like that. However, they could not locate his DD-214, which are his discharge papers, which is very instrumental in burial. However, he had decided to be buried in a family cemetery. So Debbie basically calls me, we work through things together, I get a lawyer, we go to the hospice facility here in San Antonio at Vitas, thank God they're a wonderful, wonderful hospice company, and um, we go there during COVID, I have an attorney, I take my son who is um, works with me as a witness, and we pull another witness in, and her dad had said, I want two things, I want to sign my paperwork, and then I want a beer, Yes, a beer. And usually Debbie has to stop there because people go, wait, you're a nurse handing him a beer. And I want my dog. So yes, we go in there. The attorney talks with him. He sits up. He's got all of his faculties. He signs all of his documents. And then he, um, I go and I notarize the documentation with the attorney. We scan and we have all the paperwork for Debbie and her family. And it made a difference because without him having a will in place, a simple will, um, probate in San Antonio and Bear County starts at about $4,000 for attorney's fees. With a will in place, it sometimes starts at $2,000, just depending on the level of complexity and the amount of assets. But that is the difference. And when people ask me, well, off the top of my head, how can you save me money? I'm, I always start with, do you have a will? 
if you have assets and you don't have a will, it's going to be very, very expensive for your family and it's going to be very, very difficult. So this is Debbie's family. Her father ends up passing away very peacefully at VTOS. And of course, um, that started our question when Debbie, after this all happened, and she said, wow, I, I didn't know where anything was. So we started working together. And at Lola, we work really hard with families to, to find out where things are before a life transition happens. And, you know, we've gone through a pandemic. We went through really, really scary times where people were leaving the home and going into a hospital. Nobody could be there with them. They were behind a bubble. They were but with people with masks on and covered from head to toe. And family members were finding out very quickly that they did not know where things were, passwords, how bills were paid. And it's a, it was a very uncertain time for all of us. So at Lola, we work with families to do four different things on top of the consultation. We help families gather personal information to make sure they have it all in order. We work with them to make sure they have all their financial information, making sure they have passwords and they have things like that in order. They, we talk with them about their life infrastructure because everybody's life is different. Some people are single, some people are married, some people have blended families. So we talk about those things, memberships, associations, all the things that go into making you who you are. And then we talk about your final wishes. And some families start right there. They start at the bottom and they work their way up because they realize they don't have their documents in place. And with that, you know that it's um, very difficult to have to plan a funeral if you don't know exactly what your loved one's wishes are. So let's break this down. What really can I give you as an example of what is your personal information? Well, if you are in the military, then your DD-214, that discharge piece of paper is very, very important. I will tell you that personally, I've been going at a year eight, I'm still going through documents for my father and my husband, and we could not find my dad's DD-214. Um, I couldn't find it for the life of me. And so we ended up having to bury him at San Jose with his um, family. He wanted to be buried at Fort Sam Houston because he did serve. And so I was going through documents just the other night and lo and behold, I have not found that one, not two, but three different DD-214s. So sometimes it's just a matter of people not knowing where they are um, and then finding them eight years later. I'm sure that that's not something that I've, I'm really proud of, but I wish I would have known ahead of time where that was. And then all the items that go on a death certificate, um, you know, I tell family members, just get somebody's death certificate and read it. Look at what it asks for. It asks for who your mother's maiden name. It asks what your occupation is. It asks for a social security number. Some of those things, family, they walk into a funeral home and they get stumped. And let's fa face it, you have fog. You know, you're in kind of a brain fog of, of grief after you lose somebody you love. So just having that information in a secure place where somebody knows where it's at is important. And then who is who is in your inner circle that you can trust and turn to? And this is really important because I am, and I'm glad Zelda and Jesse are on this call because they are my advocates. I, I met them and um, they have they have walked with me through some very personal moments in my life. And I think that you have to know who you can trust. You also have to have people in your corner that are partners. So I say that I, you need to have an attorney. You need to have a good CPA. You need to have a good realtor. You need to have people that are going to work for you at the best interest of you and your family and be able to forecast for you because sometimes you just can't see down um, the, the long path that you're about to enter if you're getting with somebody that's either going to pass away or they're in a very long illness. You, so your financial information, you know, how do you pay your monthly bills? There are a lot of times I sit with families and most people, believe it or not, count on your hands how many bank accounts you have. I have seven and I'm a business owner. So of course I have some business accounts, I have some personal accounts, but I also have some credit union accounts. So just knowing where to go from there who actually pays your bills if you're not able to pay them. So again, this goes back to our legal documents. You know, who is your financial power of attorney in the event something happens to you to handle your bills, your real estate? You know, what is your income stream? Who are your financial partners? You have a financial advisor and a wealth advisor. Many people come to me and think, well, I don't have a lot of money, but I, so I can't afford a financial advisor. There are a lot of great financial institutions and financial advisors that I work with as partners that will have a triage, you know, conversation with a family to say, okay, let's look at what's coming in. Let's look at what your budget is. Your husband passed away. That income has gone away. Your kids are over 18. You don't qualify for any um, time of social security for him yet. That was, that was my truth and reality. I was 46 when my husband died. He was 66. And um, the funeral home told me, yeah, you're only going to get that $255 check from the government. You will not get a widow benefit. So I lost my husband's income and his uh, social security. And then of course, you know, I was young and by myself, rolled all the way back. 
Um, but who has access to your finances? You know, again, who are those people that you trust that you can have in your corner that will know what to do and guide your family or your kids? So life infrastructure, what exactly is this? Like I said earlier, this, this is everything that makes you who you are, associations and memberships. I'm a member of AARP, AAA. I am a member of the um, San Antonio Hospice um, Association. I, you know, have Hospice Palliative Nurse Association, everything you can think of. Um, I am, I have to write down and put memberships in. I get mail all the time from my husband from his alma mater for law school. You know, there are things you just need to have in place so people know who to call and notify. Also, where are the passwords? Uh, military information, your insurance and benefits and pensions and benefits that you receive, such as social security. The passwords is really a funny thing because most people don't want to surrender their passwords. They don't want to put it out there. They don't want to talk about them. Um, same thing with your social security card. So what I always recommend is just find somebody, one person, that's all it takes is one person that you trust that's going to take care of those finances for you, access your bills, access online for you so that they understand that if something happens to you, they've got access to your life. Your final wishes. So this is the section that most people start with because it is the hardest section. You think you have prepaid for a funeral, but what is in the contract? A lot of people say, I've got this all done. I've gone to the funeral home. I just met with a family and they said, you know what? I prepaid for the funeral for my wife. And guess what? I still spent six hours at the funeral home picking out flowers. And it was just as long as if I had just gone there without having prepaid for it. So we talked a lot about, you know, sometimes people have it prepaid. Um, and then the, the funeral is maybe paid for in New Jersey. They die in San Antonio because they've moved here with their kids. Um, it's, it's a lot of detail and minutia that you need to be looking at in those contracts. Have you read the fine print? Have you discussed your wishes with your family? So I run into families that are blended. And, and this is really important for anybody that's been blended out there that has his, mine, and ours. Have you sat down with your loved one, your spouse, your partner, and said what you want? Do you want to be cremated? Do you want to be buried? Do you want your, your um, ashes scattered? What do you want that you want your end of life and your afterlife to look like? And if you have a blended family, once you've had that difficult conversation, how do you have it with each other's children? So there's not an objection after you die. So I'll use my good friend, Patricia. She is, um, her husband died, I think a little bit before my husband did, but she had a blended family and um, her, his sisters came in and, and said, and convinced her to do what they wanted her to do and not what her husband wanted to do. And still to this day, she says, you know, I really wish I would have just done what my husband had wanted because it's a regret that I have that I didn't get to fulfill. So having those blended family conversations is very important. They're very uncomfortable. It's like the elephant in the room again, but once you have it, it's like a bandaid, you just rip it right off and then you're done with it. Uh, your final wishes are more than just your legal documents. You know, it's everybody thinks that they have, that they have their will done, They've got their power of attorneys done. They've got their um, a trust set up that they're they're okay. They're done. But really, what it is is having to have those conversations with people and tell them, you know, it's more than just that. It's 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 walking the walk. What's going to happen to your home? So this is where you kind of come into this um, conversation a little when it comes to real estate. Is you know where do you um, you have a client? Where do you draw that line and say, look, your your mom's going to die. Your dad has Alzheimer's. What's going to happen? Who's going to take over? Or who's going to live in the home? What's going to happen to your dad? What, which one of you is going to take, um, help him with guardianship of making sure that he is taken care of? Do you have a budget for that? So just those little things when people say, oh, I've got everything prepared and I've got everything documented um, with my lawyer or my financial advisor. It really is more than that. It is having those really hard conversations about looking at a family and saying there's more dynamics here then you really want to face and somebody has to have this difficult conversation. And are your documents updated and have you reviewed them? So I love this. I, I go and present um, to senior care homes in San Antonio and they say, yeah, I've got my will. It's all done. And I ask them, well, how long ago did you get your will updated? You know, how long has it been since you've had an attorney review it? And they say, oh, it's been like 20 years. Like, and I'm like, oh my gosh. So yes, if it's been more than five years, things happen in five years. Have you sold something? Have you bought something? Have you moved into an independent living facility? Um, what has happened that, that would be, that would make that change for yourself and that will become outdated? So let's face it. There's a lot you don't know. Um, and we're a little past mid-year. My gosh, we're almost into fourth quarter. I can't believe the pumpkin spice is out. And how can we start finding ways to guide families through all of the planning and emotions? 
Are you able to have difficult conversations about the past few years behind you and think about the years ahead of you with your loved ones? So I'm gonna take a deep breath here, kind of take a moment to discuss a few different scenarios. So I'm gonna stop sharing real quick. Say hello to everybody, make every, sure everybody's out there. We're all breathing. I know it's a lot, it's a very difficult conversation. Okay, Alba, thanks for joining. So Alba Franco, she's one of my friends. Thanks for sharing your evening with me. <laughs> of course. Okay, so this is something that I bring out when I speak. And I'm going to try to make this bigger for you to see. But these are scenarios that I walk families through when I go out and I talk. So scenario number one is loved ones in the hospital. The case manager approaches and says they can't go home. So where do we begin with the scenario? Um, did they have a plan for plan paying for a facility, um, past approved for Medicare days? As we all know, Medicare is a very tricky thing. Um, not everybody is on Medicare and Medicaid. Um, who's overseeing the care plan? What family member? Who's taking point? Who is overseeing the bills being paid? Who is overseeing the home and pets? Most important, we can't forget about our four-legged friends. Um, but again, we go back to who's in charge, who's taking, who's taking charge in this area. So there are families that I run into, I get called in from the hospital and um, mom's going home on hospice. Dad has been, in, um, been taken care of by mom for a very long time. And um, dad looks at me and, and I say, okay, who's going to run point? Mom's going to be on hospice. And he said, no, hospice is going to take care of her. And I say, no, hospice is going to be there to support you. And as things get worse and she starts to decline, they'll be there more often. But you have to have a plan in place for who's going to care for her and be up with her overnight. So putting those conversations into play of, you know, in-home care, do you have a budget for it? Do you have long-term care? Have you been paying for something like that in insurance so that you can get the support you need? Do you have children? Do they live in San Antonio? What does that look like? And then taking another step ahead and saying, okay, so once your wife passes away, what's going to happen to you? Are you going to be able to live alone? So we start having those difficult conversations. Scenario number two, loved one is diagnosed with dementia. Wife is trying to find support system and plan as they have no children and the financial advisor will not Men usually handle the finances. They go meet with their wealth advisor. And then when they get sick or they can't speak, the wife is trying to understand and navigate all of this. And they can't, they just don't know who to talk to. So where do they begin? And do they need guardianship paperwork created? And what goes into this process? Who manages the bills, the assets in the event of a caregiver falls ill? And I work with caregivers a lot. And I always tell them it's more than just you know, what, who you're caring for to have a plan for that person, your loved one who's transitioning. It's also about you. If you went to HEB and got killed in a car accident or hurt or injured, who's going to take care of, who's got the playbook to take care of your loved one that you're caring for. So again, something difficult conversations to have, but also you need to have them. Adult children live out of town. They take turns caring for their mother. How do we begin the conversation about a care plan? And this is really generally one of the more hard discussions to have because kids that are on their own, that live out of state with their own families, they don't, they don't really want to think about putting, you know, having to bring mom up with them or having to figure that out. So it is a difficult conversation that we, we thanks to COVID, if there's any thanks to be had, we can now do those conversations over Zoom and put a plan in place, a strategy. And the last case scenario, the loved one has been in treatment for major diagnosis and medical trials. Um, for cancer, let's just say, and physicians continue care, but the loved one is becoming weaker. How do we speak up for the loved one to stop care? What does that look like? What is the difference between palliative care and hospice? And what questions do you ask and how many providers do you interview? So I actually had a client about a year ago that was going through this. Her husband was on um, a cancer trial and she could just see that it wasn't working and it was very difficult. His uh, recovery time was horrible. And so she had to finally figure out how to have the conversation with the physicians to stop treatment. Um, her husband was at the point where he was doing it for the family. And so when she finally said, no, we need to stop. And we need to start talking about palliative care and hospice, she came and said, what do I need to know? So palliative care, if you don't know, is when you are still undergoing treatment, you're still undergoing chemo or kid, um, dialysis or anything like that. Um, you can have palliative care, which is treatment for symptoms, treatment for um, anxiety, treatment for comfort. Hospice is when you've decided to stop the kidney um, dialysis, when you've decided to stop care, stop chemo, and just be comfortable. And I want to be really careful here because there are two things you need to know about hospice. Right now, 
providers don't want to ever give up on clients. They don't want to give up on their patients. So sometimes people access hospice too late. And you don't realize that hospice is for the family. It's for the, it's for the loved ones and the person that's going to transition. They're there to make the, the loved one comfortable and do some pain management, but also they're there to provide a bench for the family so that they have people that they can talk to. And there's chaplains and social workers and, you know, there's um, other nurses and medical assistants that'll come and help and support the family. And hospice can go for a long time. It's not necessarily a short period of time. So it's easy to put somebody in a position where you, they don't want to give up. They always think hospice is, I'm going to die. It sometimes will take a year. I think I have an aunt that's actually on hospice. She's been on it for two years. So sometimes just having that extra bench strength is there for you. But with hospice, some people just have providers that just want to keep going and they don't want to give up. And other times it's just a hard conversation to say, you know what, let's just get comfortable. And we have had patients that we worked with that um, go off of hospice. They actually get better. And so they go off of hospice for a little bit. So I always want to warn people that, you know, it's not always um, bad, you know, it's not always means end of life, um, but it's something that, that, you know, it's a good conversation piece to have. And I, and part of my partnership with my trusted partners is I have hospice people that educate palliative people. I have, you know, all kinds of educational people around me because it's me throwing the ball to them. It, we're quarterbacking. We're making sure that we're getting people what they need. Okay. With that, taking a pulse here. Everybody still good? Okay. All right. So we're going to continue on and we're going to take a little bit of a short turn. So this is one of my favorite pictures because if you like elephants like I do, and I love the bunny and they're sitting there looking into the sunset and they're just being quiet and still, which is sometimes what caregivers need. So we've gone through the scenarios I'm going to push through these real quick. So let's talk about being intentional. And this is where I get a little mushy because it's the part of my, my, my conversation with you about you. And if you're in this um, arena of helping people and um, going through that transition and after loss and grief and working with families, um, having to sell a home or having to stage a home or having to get a home ready for um, like we, Amy and I were talking earlier about our parents are aging. They want to age in place, but they've got lots of stairs. You know, it's having these conversations are hard. And so sometimes you need to be able to take care of yourself. And as caregivers, um, I want to talk a little bit about love because love is the product of truthful communication. Love is the willingness and ability to allow others the right to make their own choices for themselves without any insistence that they satisfy me. And loving myself is having the willingness and acquiring the ability to allow myself the right to make my own choices for myself without the need for the approval of others. Self-care while caring for a loved one is knowing when to take a break, having resources to turn to, not being afraid to ask for help, and understanding you are grieving and you're grieving your loved one while they are passing away. This really works when we're working with families that are caregivers taking care of Alzheimer's patients or family members. Um, and I tell them you're you're grieving your loved one because they're 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 going through their disease. And they can't remember the same things that you do. They don't have those same memories. It's very frustrating. And that's the ongoing grief process that happens with families. And it makes it really hard. So just understanding that and telling somebody it's okay to be okay to be sad. So grief, you're not alone. Grief is the normal and natural reaction to a loss of any kind. Grief is the conflicting feelings caused by the end of or change in a familiar pattern of behavior. Grief is the feeling of reaching out for that someone who has always been there only to discover when I need them one more time, they're no longer there. And grief is the feeling of reaching out for someone who has never been there only to discover when I need them one more time, they're still not there. So emotional jails, um, this is kind of important because their past is 10% of fond memories and 90% regrets. And your future is 10% planning and 90% worry or fear. Responsibility is what has happened, but how you choose to respond to the event today, otherwise you remain a victim in emotional jail. And we see people, right, that have had a loss and maybe even through COVID where they didn't really get that full funeral um, service to be able to have a, a, a proper goodbye. And so they kind of just get stuck in this emotional jail of not being able to move forward because they're just stuck in that place of total sadness and grief. So we like to talk a little bit about the present moment formula, which is knowledge isn't completeness. Approval is an inside job. Unresolved grief drains energy and limits choices. 
and active grief recovery is essential to moving forward. There are many people that say, you know, I'm, I'll know when I'm ready to start going through a grief recovery program or getting a grief group or, or cleaning out the house or selling the house, any of that stuff, right? Um, I always tell people, like, if you fell and broke your arm, like literally broke it, you know, it's broken, you got to go to the emergency room, would you go or would you wait? And most people go, well, yeah, I go to Im immediately to the emergency room. I wouldn't wait. And I'm like, it's kind of like that with grief, just getting a little bit of triage right in the beginning so that you get on a good start is, um, and having the tools to be able to function through that grief is really important for processing and, and being healthy about it. I'll be honest. It's been eight years since I've lost my husband and my father. It's still hard. Um, there's still moments when the holidays come around the corner and I'm like, golly, you know, I really, really miss having those conversations. And um, so grief is an active process for people. And some people stay in it a little bit longer. Some people are healthy about it. And like myself, I can talk about it. So grief is something that we shouldn't be afraid of having conversations around. So fine feelings inside, not expressed moving into the fall of 2022 um, or 2023, knowing when to say I'm not okay, or wait, hold on, 2022, I'm going a year ahead, sorry guys, knowing when to say I'm not okay, this is important, especially as we start moving into these holidays, knowing when to ask for help, having a team to turn to, really important, getting your affairs in order, it's more than about, than about your loved one you're caring for, it's about you too, and reviewing important documents. So with that, I know I went through this really quick and really fast. Are there any questions? Is there anybody? I know I talk like I'm on fire. People always tell me that when I would uh, do public speaking, they'd say, gosh, you're, you're talking like you've got a five, like fire behind you. So um, I, I just want to take a pause. Well, I, I just have to say this was a, one of the best reviews of the whole process that I have heard. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's good to hear. You know, sometimes um, we do these presentations so often that you forget. And there are times when I forget to say things. I do want to talk a little about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Does anybody know who she is? So she, yeah, she talks about the, the stages of grief. And um, I laugh because I have a really good friend who just got married in Denver. And um, of course, Carl had died in San Antonio. I had to go back to Denver for work. And I get there and she says, look, I've looked up the stages of grief and I'm with you with everything except for the anger. I won't do anger with you. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> you know. But Elizabeth Kubler-Ross actually wrote those stages of grief for the person that's dying. And when that person... Yeah, when that when you see that person go through the process, you're like, oh, I, I know where you're at. So having that understanding because we've transitioned it and transferred it over to the people, family members for after a loss and stuff like that. But I like to always tell people, understand that we all live in a sea of grief, that everybody is going through something and that loss is not just loss of life, it's loss of a loved our loved one, it's loss of a pet. Um, you know, that's really, it's tragic when you lose your animals. I've, I've lost my animal this year. I think Zelda and Jesse lost their family pet. It's, it's a hard thing to get over. Um, so that little hurdle, and then you have um, loss of a financial situation. And for employers out there, if you're working with employers, um, loss of trust in the workplace is a huge one since we've gone back to work and people have gone back into the workplace. It's not the same. People are different. And um, if you get your trust violated at work and you don't have a safe workplace to go to, it can be unbearable. And that is the beginning of the end for a really valued employee. So loss of trust is also really important. Anybody else? Well, you, you mentioned Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's book, but I'd like to mention your book. Oh, um, you. You've got a book. It's called uh, Lying on the Floor, Holding My Breath. And it's about your and what the process and how you came through it. So I just wanted yeah. to put a plug in there for your book. It's yeah. on Amazon. I can put the uh, I could put the link in here. That'd be wonderful. And just so you know, I I, I made I wrote that book um, so that you could read it in thirty minutes. It's not supposed to be <laughs> a, a novel. You know, yeah. I wanted people to read it and go, "Oh my God, I'm prepared." Um, but the reason it's called "Lying on the Floor," you know, trying to catch my breath, holding my breath, was because oh. I was holding my breath. Um, one of the things my daughter's a yoga instructor, so she kept telling me, "You're holding your breath." you're holding your breath. And I was like, no, I'm not. She said, yes, you are. And I go, you're right. I am holding my breath, <laughs> trying to catch my breath because grief does that to you. You're breathing from the top versus the bottom of your, of your belly. Um, and so it's really important, but I was literally on the floor in the bathroom. I was running for my life because my employer had decided I just wasn't valuable anymore. And I was showing up and basically I was, I was causing other people to be uncomfortable being vulnerable about my grief. And um, I had a coach because I couldn't find a me. I couldn't find a Lola person when I was going through this. 
in Denver. Mm -hmm. So the closest I got was a business coach who immediately sent me over Brene Brown's um, speech, TED talk on vulnerability. And she said, you, <laughs> you are showing everybody in that organization how to grieve. And you know what? You don't stop. And I knew that 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 was my third loss, losing my job and really realizing that I had to run for my life because they didn't understand me. They didn't understand what I was going through. And I look back on that as an experience that I've created a whole corporate plan just based on that for employers, because my employer just didn't know any better. They didn't know how to talk to me. They didn't know how to um, approach me, but all they could say was, wow, you're making a lot of mistakes and we're going to have to put you on a PIP plan. And I was like, you know, lost my dad, lost my husband, and now I'm going to lose my job. And it was a yes. very vulnerable place. So that book really came from being on the floor and um, having to figure out how I was going to get out and pack my cube and run for my life. And I'm grateful. I made it back to San Antonio where better food, better tacos, <laughs> friends, family, um, and out of those experiences came loss of life advocates. So um, I'm not grateful for the experiences, but um, grateful that that I had a, a power higher than me that was telling me your story is not done yet. And for those that are on here now, she also does training in this, correct? Yes, I have a certification plan, which Alba and Zelda and Jesse are certified advocates. So I train people to um, go through the process. I have forms that I work people through and through those forms, get the conversation going about um, blended families and, oh, you have property. And you'd be surprised when people start talking about property. I had a woman that called me yesterday and she's like, my husband managed everything, but we have like acre like hundreds of acres in fall city and i've got acres in medina and i've got my home and i've got this i need land people i need people to help me and you know so it's not until you're having those conversations and saying tell me about your property tell me about your real estate that people start opening up and saying oh yeah i inherited one sixteenth of an acre from my grandmother and it's with all my cousins and i don't even know what it means and the spouse goes what do you mean you've inherited this what am i supposed to do with it if you die <laughs> like we can't even medina has like it's a puddle you know i mean there's nothing there so some of the conversations through those forms we do training and then we um also walk through the case scenarios that um i was showing you earlier so we just do a lot of experiential um Re, you know, working with people, and I actually just started a chaplain program. So we're working with chaplains specifically to get trained on Lola, so that they, when they're talking with families, they can walk them through getting prepared. Um, because the chaplains usually get called in at the end. You know, they're there to do last rites, or they're there to have those hard conversations. Um, so now chaplains are wanting to know, like, how do I get a family get get them ahead of it, um, especially if they're a hospice chaplain. So yes, the training is. Um, it's amazing. And I've got some really, really great, great people that work with me. Anybody? Okay. So Alba says, and keeping the Lola plan updated is important. Okay. I had surgery a couple of weeks ago and wanted to ensure my info was current. It took me three hours because I underestimated how much had changed in the last two years. Lesson learned, take a few minutes and update at the point of change. Don't let changes accumulate because we never remember changes. <laughs> I'm just going to speak from experience. Um, and you never know what tomorrow may bring. And that's, by the way, Alba, that's amazing. Yeah, I, I think most of us would agree with that. Um, but I think most importantly is that education piece of the awareness, because there's some great little gold nuggets here that we mm -hmm. all went an aha moment that you're right, we don't think about it, or we yes. don't have that conversation yeah. with family. It's, a it's lot of people are so afraid to come forward and talk about it. They just figure, well, put it away in a box and forget about it and leave it to somebody else to worry about. Oh. And then you find out that they pass away and everything is in chaos. But yes. do you think that comes from the our upbringing? Because yes. our upbringing and our generation before that, like our parents' upbringing and our, our grandparents' upbringing was very much stuff it down. Let's no feelings, no this, no that. And let's not talk about those things. Banking's private. My financial stuff, even from the kids. I, I mean, my mom's visiting me. Sorry, but she's not here. <laughs> she's out. But my, my mom's like that. Mm -hmm. you know she it's yeah. it, it, I I guess and that, that elephant is the, in the room is yeah I have these little approach it they're this big and I take them out 
I put them up on like in the middle of a table and everybody's like, oh, that's so cute. And I said, you see how cute it is? It's little, it's taking yeah. up this whole room because y'all don't want to have yeah. this conversation. Like we need to address it. Let's get it out of the way. Let's just have a hard conversation. But I agree. I mean, I think that some people, um, my mom and my dad, you know, didn't really talk about it. My dad didn't talk about it till my mom died. And then, um, you know, when he was like, okay, you have to know everything. I was like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't know if I want to know everything, but thank God we'd had all the card conversations because I, I look back on it. And I think uh, if I did not know what, you know, even down to the pacemaker, like I have a pacemaker here's make it, I've made a copy of the card to put in, in, in my paperwork so that in that, at the end of my life, the, the pacemaker is going to try to keep me alive. <laughs> I need you to make sure that's off. Um, and so just the little things, you know, that people don't talk about, but I think my dad was forced to it, talk about it because my mom had died. Like, you know, if, if he wouldn't, if she wouldn't have died, he would, probably would have never said anything to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that loss and grief and all the things, you know, we're not supposed to have the feels. And I think that the pandemic did bring that out and more and more people are t wanting to talk about it and needing people to talk to. So um, we are really good about our partners. And I know I said, I'd talk about that um, because Amy, you're a partner, you know, you work with Lola, Jesse and Zelda are partners. Um, they work with Lola for liquidation. I have a lot of great people that just, I can't do what I do and all the, and everything that we do as a Lola advocates, when we're working with a family, we quarter, we quarterback, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not a real estate agent. I just know really fabulous people. And those fabulous people make Lola look good. Thank God, because it's my mom's name. Um, but with, but without them, I would just be walking around like babbling, talking about this. And people in the very beginning were like, I don't understand what you do. And it's very clear now. They're like, oh, wow, you're that person that when they were taking my mom off the breathing machine at the hospital, the nurses were calling you to explain what was going to happen to them a second time because the family couldn't understand so again, I'm just, you know, a soft place to land and with compassion and empathy. So if y'all need anything, you know, doors always open for anybody. Yeah. And you go out of, out of state too. Like you could talk to people right yeah. over zoom or whatnot. Yeah. I've had We're some, not all in Texas. So you know, I had a, a family that a good friend of mine that called me, I, the husband and husband called me from a plane and said, I'm on my way to Anacortes, Washington, where my mom and my sister live with the twins. They had two twin nephews. He had two twin nephews that were nine, I believe. And um, there was a house fire and one of the twins died in the house fire. And he called and said, I don't want anybody talking to my mom or my sister. I want you to be point of contact for farmer's aid insurance. And so I was dealing with five farmer's agents, investigators, um, funeral homes, medical examiners, fire department officials. And so sometimes we are just that communication for people, but we've worked with families in Seattle, San Diego, and Connecticut. And um, so really COVID did kind of expand services for us because we realized that we don't have to be in a room to touch them. Um, we simply just need to be available. And um, sometimes this is enough, just having a Zoom call or a phone conversation to say, I can hear you and let me identify and, and put a strategy in place for you. Yeah, I said you have to do conflict res I'm sorry. I said that's a good thing because I'm in Florida. So oh, I was you know? thinking that you were I'm only in Washington. available. Oh, there yeah. you go. Yeah. I have an advocate in Florida. She just moved down there about a year ago and she's trying to get her feet underneath her. So hopefully maybe she'll she'll still charge up <laughs> and, and put herself out there to work. How do I get information to give to people who should have this information? Like, I would like to give this to my senior care network that I was just at luncheon today, and they're all all the professionals and community relations directors for senior housing and senior communities and assisted livings. They're all there. How do I get this to them so mm -hmm. those people who are in the homes already mm -hmm. that have memory issues or dementia or or all this, how do I get this to them and their families and so I can have that service also? Well, if you want to um, email me at Esther, at Esther, E-S-T-H-E-R, at loss of I'll have, I'll have you, Eve, yep. Eve, go yeah. ahead and put it in the chat box for yeah. everybody. Yeah, and you can email me and I'll send you information. I have a wonderful admin <laughs> that is working with us now. I finally got to the point where I have an admin. I was like, oh my gosh, it sounds so, sound, sound so official. And then I have a researcher, one of my our childhood friends, Amy, and I have a friend that she is rabbit down the hole. She is Johnny on the spot. I can give her anything. Um, but we can send information over to you and some, some flyers and, and, and anything that you need. I mean, even if it's just emailing you some of the, 
the marketing materials that we have, we're happy to do that. Great. I also on Facebook Live, Vince asked, do you have a chapter in any other state? Um, so right now, just Texas. And then I actually have a partnership with um, three other women that are called Pals After Loss Professionals. And they are in Atlanta, Georgia, Nashville, Tennessee, and North Carolina. And so they those they do similar work that I do. So they are in those states. And if not, then we are spreading out and trying to train as many people to do what we do in this area. So um, we're real excited. We're, we kick, we're kicking off a training program for after loss professionals. And then of course I have the Lola certification, which um, covers more of the before and during, and theirs is more that I have with them is more of the after stuff, but the after stuff is where people get stuck. And so we're trying to get more people trained because we realize this ocean that we live in, there are a lot of people that are out there working and saying that they can help, um, but they are not trained. And so we put a training, to, training program together to legitimize this market. So the answer is we're getting there. If you're interested, let me know. Um, we'd be happy to send you more information. Thank you. I would love the information. Even if I don't take it, um, I have some people who might be really interested in that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's the only way to grow, right? You know, yeah. and when I started this, I said, I just, I'd never envisioned having employees. I wanted to have um, contract people that would, I could I'd get trained up and they could go out into the world and do this on their own. And it could be a business plan for them. And that's really how we wanted the model to work. And I've just been really lucky and it's organically grown. And then the level of work that we're doing is just way different than I thought it was ever going to be. So um, it is a very, very um, fulfilling <laughs> job to have. Well, I want to say that we've got about eight more minutes. So if you have any questions, please open up your mics and feel free to go ahead and ask her. I'm monitoring our Facebook Live. Um, and thank you, Vince, for um, I hope she answered your question. Um, over on Facebook. <laughs> and if there's anybody else, please open your mics and go ahead and ask. And if there's any um, information that you need, we'll be happy to drop it in the chat box for you. I'm not really sure if this is a, a question. Um, I've, I'm finding out a lot these days because my father's on hospice. And be mm -hmm. before this happened, I, did, I didn't have an understanding of what hospice was. And I don't know when I would have decided to proactively for myself find out what hospice is. I know there's a lot of other things that if I had thought earlier, I would come to someone like you and I would have all those ducks in a row. But in terms of learning things like hospice, how do, I don't know, how, how does a person get to where they know they have to find that stuff out? So, you know, the, the earlier, the better. I always say, you don't even have to be on hospice to go to an educator. So any hospice company have, have what they call educators or marketing people that will sit down and evaluate a family ahead of time. And I always tell people, even before you think you're, you're going to be eligible, go down this path, start interviewing, you know, start interviewing companies and start putting three people on your list and saying, Ooh, I really like this company or I compare these companies. And, you know, this is what um, I feel comfortable with them coming in my home and really doing that, that test on them. But the education ahead of time, I, I'm a guru of knowledge is power. So the more you know ahead of time, the better off it is so that you're not caught off guard. Um, I do the same thing with in-home care. So the, the lady that called me yesterday that said, I've got this land and all these things going on. She's taking care of her husband. She's the primary caregiver. And she said, I, I think I need hospice. I'm not really sure. So I was able to connect her with a hospice educator that I work with and say, look, she's probably not really ready to make that decision, but I think she needs to be educated on what it can do to help her. Um, and then the same thing with some other providers for in-home care, because she's trying to band-aid approach it and putting things together. And um, she, what she really needs is for some, you know, to have those people in line and set up. And especially during COVID, I would tell people, hey, you need to have at least three companies on your list interviewed at all times, because if company wow. gets COVID and they're broken out, then you have to go to company B. And these families that get this 24-hour care that for their loved ones, when they go home, they don't necessarily the one person can come in one day and the next day it's a totally different care, care provider. So if your, your loved one is being cared for by, you know, um, a, a 17 year old, I mean, it's been really irritating, irritating for me because the poor industry of home care, they can't seem to find people that can help. And they're, they're getting people younger and younger to go in and take care of 80 year old people. And so I'm like, interview, 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 and ask the questions of, you're the Cadillac, you're the Mercedes pulling up, you're the marketing person with the, you know, 
beautiful smile and you're there to wow the doctors and get past the referral person and past the receptionist to get the referrals in because you're a salesperson, but who's actually driving up and taking care of your loved one? Like who is that person that's actually going to um, show up on a daily basis and they're going to be your extended family until your loved one passes away. So get to know them, understand who they are so you can organize them. What's she showing us? Unmute. <laughs> we have to ask to unmute. Oh, it looks like somebody asked to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work. Okay. <laughs> I have found a co-op of home caregivers. Oh, Each great. one of the caregivers actually owns part of this company. So oh. they are invested. And these people oh. come. And when you interview one, that's the one that will come. That is awesome. And I, and I have a whole, a whole folder here full of stuff that I have kept and all the people that I've met. And so I'm just a realtor. So I stay in my lane, but right. I have all this information to pass on. But I it goes like, back, to, it goes back to Esther is the knowledge is power and connection. Exactly. And when you connect, you know, when you go into your community and you educate on the simplest things, um, you know, as home modifications or whatever it is, as a real estate agent or as a, you know, as Lola, you're bringing in one more little golden nugget of information that you didn't exactly. know to take away and go, oh my gosh, I didn't think about that. Because right. I promise you, we're going to walk away from this call and we are going to ask ourselves one of the questions that you have on your slide. Oh my God, did we have this or do we have that person? Or does that person have that person? Because I know I'm going to Well, away. I would say that um, I had a few real estate agents that have come through and gotten certified and it's because I always tell them people are having the, one of the biggest transactions of their life with a real estate agent. They're going through and the real estate agent knows exactly what they like, what they don't like. Oh, they like black. They don't like white. <laughs> it's like They like these fixtures. Like, so they get to know them really well and intimate, but you're helping them with this big, very big investment. So if something happens to that family, let's say the husband and wife are young, everything's good. Husband gets in a car accident and dies. You want them to call you back because you're the real estate agent. You're the person that helped them get in the home. Now you're helping them look and evaluate that strategy. Hey, wait, you didn't take out the mortgage insurance. So now we got to figure out, can you afford to stay in the home without your spouse? So, you know, it's a, it's a conversation. So I always think the real estate agent is actually a quarterback, just like a Lola advocate, because they're the ones that are saying, Hey, you're getting ready to, to get in over your head or you know, maybe if it's one of you died, do you have, what do you have in place? So the Lola forms, I have a few real estate agents here in San Antonio that actually got certified and they go through the forms and they gift them to families as they, as they buy the house. And then they walk them through as an advocate. And they're like, okay, so if anything happens, heart attack, stroke, anything good, bad soccer game, graduations, I want to be your person. I want to be that person that travels with you through life because you're, we're going to age, either you're aging in place in the house, or you're going to have to make a change at some point and move out, you want them coming back to you, you know, so you want to be that quarterback in the corner. So yeah. I call that, by the way, I call that modify or move. Yes. Because you all the time. <laughs> you modify your home or move out of it. And if whatever your line of work is, but if you are able to accommodate somebody at some point with that modifier or move and transition either educationally or, and, or with a sale of a home, it's that much better. Yeah. It helps yeah. It's a community. It makes a difference. You know, when yeah. I'm working with families that one child, you know, the mom dies and the kid, the daughter has been living in the home with the dad. And so she's trying to take care of dad. And I'm like, you know, you know, you've got Medicaid, this five-year look back thing. It's a whole strategy, you know, and as a real estate agent, you're actually kind of in that sweet spot of being able to guide people down that path and saying, look, you know, we're seeing these things happening. If you're really involved in keeping up with them, you're aging or your parents are aging. There's a five-year look back. There's a lot of things that go on too. If they're going to need 24-hour care or Medicaid, um, I, I read an interesting thing about that. Um, and I, I don't know if other people are doing this, but, you know, with the shortage of in-home care aids and stuff, people are actually trying with that five-year look back, paying family members to care for them yeah. in lieu of 
paying taxes on that and avoiding it like like that gift tax that you're going to pay to yeah. one of your children. So you can not only gift it to them, but they're also caring for you at the same time. Yeah. And so, you- yeah, I live with my son and his wife. I know <laughs> it's, it sounds crazy, but we during COVID liked each other so much, which doesn't, I know not every family is like this, um, but we love each other so much that I sold my childhood home to them. And then earlier this year um, in May, June, we sold the home and we got into something bigger to accommodate all of us. And it's kind of like when people ask me, wow, you don't have your own space. I'm like, I actually do. I have a very great, they have a really great living situation because they're on one side of the house. I'm on the other. And the generational home is coming back because I know that if I get to the point where I can't age in place or they need to put me in a home, I've got my strategy set up because the hardest thing is that real estate, you know, is to liquidate. Do we keep it? Um, transfer on death deed. There's so many things that go into to that process of helping a family strategize. So um, yes, you're, you as real estate agents and what y'all are doing is amazing because you have a, I will say the biggest investment people are going to buy and spend in their lifetime is going to be buying a house. <laughs> so, so congratulations. It's the wealthiest, by the way, over the age of 65, it's the wealthiest homeownership demographic because we tend to own our homes outright. You know, we've been in there 40, 50, 60 yeah. years. So when it comes to us getting sick or needing something, we need to pull from that one, you know, from that in order to help us. But that um, more, the generational thing is definitely coming back and, and helping each other. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was at swim lessons, listening to my grandson scream for 30 minutes before I came on this call. It's, it's a blessing. I get to see him every single yeah. day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's definitely, it's the strategies around aging and aging in place and Amy, what you're doing and when I make connections and um, everything that you all do. Thank you. Because I'm just the quarterback. I can't, I can't do any of this, you know, without any of you. Yeah. But let me tell you, it takes all of us to play the game. There you go. And to win. I mean, it really right. all it takes every one of us. The Teamwork, village, right? Teamwork it's makes the village. Yep. You know, and every one of us brings something to the table or gives something to somebody else that's out off that's not on here. So right. I thank you. And okay, so we're done. Um, I'm I'm it's it's 8 p.m. my time. <laughs> but I it's 8 okay, p.m. my any, time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Eve Hill, why well, don't you tell everybody what we got going well, on? Just very time. briefly, we have a gentleman named Jonathan Leeper, who's a, a fall prevention specialist. He used to be a rehab nurse. He's got a podcast. He's an incredible, detailed, knowledgeable individual. And I hope everybody has a chance to come join us next Tuesday. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Thank you Thank so you much. Again. Thank you again. Thanks, Esther. Amazingly informative. Thank you. Thank you, Zelda. Thank, and you. Very Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.